So what I think we're going to do is start by having each panelist just introduce themselves. That is the three that haven't already or haven't been introduced. Um, and maybe just say a sentence or two about you know, what perspective you have on the problem, maybe to help seed the discussion, and then we'll proceed from there. So oh, we'll start with that. I guess I go first. OK. I'm Ann Churchland from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, and I run an experimental lab. We study decision making and multisensory integration in humans, rats, and mice, and we make neural measurements uh, with imaging and electrophysiology in the mice. Uh, so uh, I guess I'll comment on the on the topic throughout this panel debate, um, but overall. Uh, I think there's clearly a ton to be learned by looking really closely at the biology, and I would argue that a lot of what now constitute core computational principles in the field um, uh, emerge from looking at raw neural responses and thinking about what they mean and what principles they might invite us to consider when thinking about uh, how the brain works. Uh, I'm Tony Mofshin. I'm in the Center for Neuroscience at NYU. I study the visual system and visual processing. Um, Usually when I find myself in this kind of situation, I am the one who's defending algorithms and representations against the onslaught of uh, dendritic people and connectomics and things like that. In this room, I suspect I'll be in the opposite position trying to remind everybody, which I just reminded my first year undergraduate class of yesterday, which is that the brain works the way it does because it's made of meat. And you should remember that it's made of meat whenever you think about how it works. So my perspective here is the perspective of the meat. I assume you mean meat metaphorically, because uh, as a physiologist, I might take exception with that analogy. <laughs> You're a physiologist? <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Where's um, the actin? <laughs> I'm uh, Odo Oliva. I'm a research scientist at the Computer Science Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT. I'm a neuroscientist who also train uh, deep neural networks. And with my team, uh, we look at question of perception, uh, memory, vision, audition. Great, thanks. That's so um, maybe I'll start with one question and then hope that that will invoke others. And certainly anybody in the panel can feel free to jump in or ask questions of your own. And then I think you know, we'll also at some point ask that the audience be brought into the discussion. Um, so I guess the first question I have is, is sort of the obvious one. Um, and I guess there's two dimensions to it. One, how can we bring these different um, uh, different approaches together. And I think we heard some sort of reaches in that direction, but I guess I'd challenge the group to try and be more specific. Say, what specific areas are most, most promising for trying to really connect one to the other? And then, I don't know if it's quite orthogonal, but maybe not you know, exactly the same dimension, is how can we take the problem up? And this is especially a challenge, I think, to the neuroscientists, um, to addressing real problems, like how people bake a cake, right? Or how you, well, drive a car. Um, and I think the machine learning community has certainly taken that on, um, and in some sense may have leapfrogged the cognitive psychologists and, and the neuroscientists for sure in this regard. So how can we start asking those questions using the sorts of tools that Yoshua talked about um, and the sort of conceptual frameworks that Tom talked about, but actually addressing real problems. And I'll just throw in there, um, not just theoretically how can we do it, but what kinds of methodologies should we be using? So, so Tom um, suggested some, and I, I think it'd be interesting to hear some elaboration on that or any other ideas or challenges that people think are relevant to this. So. So one thing I'd like to see more of uh, are neuroscience um, and psychology experiments of the kind that we are asking our machine learning systems to solve. Um, and I think it would help to maybe uh, force uh, the, the brain scientists to ask the kind of questions that machine learning uh, people have been trying to answer. And um, that's on one side. On the other side, uh, unfortunately, there aren't that many AI slash machine learning people here in the room. And I think uh, bringing that community in greater numbers uh, in places like this would be important. I'm not sure how to do that, but I sense a lot of enthusiasm in the young generation uh, that are not yet corrupted by money uh, to uh, somehow 
do something in machine learning that connects with uh, neuroscience, the brain, and so on. Can, can you give some examples of problems that, you th that are machine learning problems that you think should be explored as experimental tasks? Well, I mean, the, there's already work, I think, that goes in the direction where people are studying, uh, uh, say, learning of new uh, image categories uh, in the context where you've already, you know, you already have some knowledge of, of image categories. And, you know, uh, I think that's an example. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what, what the answer to your question is, but a requirement is that it wouldn't be sufficient to train a shallow network on top of existing representations, right? So, so in fact, there's a way to answer your question which is empirical. We can, we can try to make uh, a neural net solve this, and maybe one that's already pre-trained with the, that modality, and if it can't, uh, unless you allow to tune all the layers and not just the last one, then this is probably an interesting task. And so this, is, uh, this could be a fairly easy thing to, to check. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that makes sense, but I think there's also a danger in doing that, which is, so, so when um, uh, Noam Chomsky was criticizing B.F. Skinner's kind of behaviorist view of how the mind works, uh, you know, Skinner would say, you know, well, we found that there are these same learning principles that apply in rats and in people, and Chomsky's response was, well, that's because you put people in tasks where they have to act like rats, right? Like, so right. you <laughs> construct a task where the way that you have to solve it is by doing 300 t trials of hitting a button in response to a stimulus, and then it's not necessarily a surprise that you find the same mechanism. So okay, I think, so, I think so, a so here's uh, maybe uh, another example. In machine learning, often we try to solve tasks that humans solve, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe, maybe one example that's fairly realistic and that would allow humans and machines to be more or less on the same foot is learning a new video game. Mm -hmm. sure. So there's a lot of research with deep reinforcement learning and uh, you know, training a machine to play a video game. Uh, and I, I think that this is an interesting setting because it's artificial, you can control it, you, know, you guys will like that. Uh, and it, it's usually non-trivial, so we know that it, it's hard to do these things. Um, and, um, and it's something that humans do, right? So it's not artificial. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it is artificial, but I guess it's now most people do it, so. Yeah, the, the, I agree that the idea of a video game is appealing, um, but I think the, the enthusiasm for training tasks to animals, I really share your enthusiasm for that, and I think it's a real possibility. Um, one example from the categorization front is from the Allen Institute. So there's a, a team there, I think it's led by Sean Olson, that's been training mice. Um, they, they learn to identify numbers, one through seven, uh, and then they're shown different variants of those numbers. It's from a, from a known data set where people have written down the numbers. So, you know, sometimes the one has a little hook on it and sometimes it doesn't. And the mice are, are really pretty good at learning that. Um, and then uh, learning to, to generalize, right? So they have a training set and then they're able to, to categorize um, new numbers that they haven't seen before into the appropriate category. So I think it's really feasible in that particular example. Um, you're right, they're probably not using the same strategy that the humans would, because obviously the numbers don't have a semantic uh, meaning no, to the mice. Maybe that's a good but thing. That could be because, a good thing. Because then you really have to learn uh, not just uh, to tune the last layer, but somehow to learn the right features and if it's some, some, some kind of stimuli that's not natural stimuli, I think, then the brain of the, my, the mouse has to really change in, in deeper ways. Yeah, for sure. And they're, and they're able to learn that task um, fairly readily, and now they're in a position where they can measure neural activity both during the learning and in the expert phase. But you should also check that you can't learn that with a simple logistic regression, right? <laughs> True. <laughs> oh, you want also my response? <laughs> Why not? Uh, well, yeah, so um, more generally, um, there's not only one species of brain. In neuroscience, there are many species of brain, exactly as you say, with the mice and the, the dolphin and the bats and, and the human and so on. So um, I'm very new to the uh, field of uh, the deep neural networks, but what I, I see going to the conferences is that there's also many species of deep learning <laughs> approaches and models. And right now, they are self-evolving in all directions extremely fast. So there might be 
two stands. The first for the neuroscientist is to watch a little longer where that field is going and to see if there's some state that are a little more stable. The second. So, so, so we wrote a book trying to you know, show a snapshot of uh, what was going to be stable. I think it's a good starting point. So <laughs> the second thing is before waiting for the stability, there are so many neuroscientists who are now excited to use a model as a test base, as a framework to test hypotheses, because you can be invasive with your uh, deep learning model. You take it on the web and you change parameters or you retrain. And if you see the neural networks as species that you can go and test and look and compare, I think this exploration is very good for the field because it's so new. There's so much to go and grasp. So we might be neuroscientists and computer scientists in, in this uh, journey for some time where we are going to explore. So now, which one is becoming stable? Because if you wrote a book on it, we need to know. <laughs> it, it's, as you said, it's moving so fast, it's already outdated. <laughs> All right, so. Um, but the thing is, you need some time. I mean, yeah. in science, it's true to, to know that a technique uh, you know, imposes itself. Yes. Uh, when we wrote the GAN paper, we thought it was just another NIPS paper that would go to oblivion, but, well, two or three years later, it's a very different story. So y y it takes a few years before stabilization happens. Um, I wanted to speak to John's question about also more realistic kinds of tasks in psychology. So I, I mentioned um, that website that we made which has these naturally occurring data sets. Um, and I think those are actually a real challenge for psychology in a good way uh, because they force us to engage with the kind of data which is gathered from naturalistic tasks and involves dealing with questions like how do you represent naturalistic images in a way that allows us to build cognitive models that we can test on those kinds of data? And I actually think that's a really important way that like, deep learning has actually expanded the scope of the kinds of things that we can do as scientists in terms of saying, okay, one of the things that these methods are really good at is finding representations for really complex stimuli. And that gives us the potential to then begin to ask scientific questions about can we make predictions of human behavior processing those naturalistic stimuli, maybe not taking exactly the raw representations that come out of those, those networks, but taking those representations as a starting point that we can use to build you know, models that ultimately we can use to solve a much wider range of problems than we used to be able to. And I think, I think that's a really important contribution. Let me, let me pull something in here because, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I find myself confused but at a lower level than the one we've been talking about recently. But what you said there just, just sort of makes a point for me, which is that I think in physiology it's fairly easy for us to see and describe representations of things in the brain. We know how to study them. We can measure them with uh, fMRI machines. We can measure them with electrodes and so on. What's much harder to see and much harder to describe are computations based on those representations. We can identify things we call computations because we see transformations of representations from one level to another. And in that respect, we're really no more um, insightful than a deep network is because the deep network has some representation at one level and another representation at another level. But it's not clear to me how we will achieve either in biology or in deep networks an understanding of how you actually transform things one to the next. I like to believe that the transformations step to step in the brain are relatively simple and we can write them down and describe them. Um, and I can make some suggestions about simple ones that might do the job. But I sort of lack the faith that they will ultimately answer the questions you're asking, like how do we take a complex representation of a natural scene and turn it into a behavioral outcome or some kind of deeper uh, set of knowledge about that. So, yeah. so I'd like to actually follow up on that and make a statement that I'll turn into a question. <laughs> um, I, I sort of perceive um, one of the thresholds that we're on now is one of asking not how do the different parts, and by that I don't care whether you mean brain system or cognitive function or learning algorithm or processing algorithm, not necessarily just learning. Um, but so, so we're, we're gaining, I think we're sort of gaining enough of an outline or we have sort of a foot in the door on enough of these that, that an outline is sort of coming into view of what the parts are. 
But I think one of the challenges has been, and I haven't seen it at all in neuroscience or psychology, with one exception, which is sort of the unified cog theories of cognition movement, you know, ACT-R basically. Um, and I've seen it happen, in, of course, in machine learning, but in a way that's sort of uninformed as, I, as I've sort of observed it um, by what we know about the mind or the brain. Um, how these parts come together. I mean, and I feel the threshold we're on is we have to start asking that question. And for me, I think the challenge, so the challenge up until now has been, well, maybe we don't know enough about the parts, so we can't how they, no, ask how they work together. I think we have enough candidates for parts that we can start asking how they work together. So the challenge, but we haven't. And, and, you know, whether that's just because, you know, we're just getting there or something else is hard to say, but I'll, I'll propose that there is at least one something else, and that is we don't have a language for doing that. There's no tools that allow us to sort of exchange ideas in a sufficiently standardized way that if I want to build a model of, say, deep learning and then add attention in, that I can do it by taking a model of attention that somebody else has. So I gather that when you start adding attention to your networks, you write it in exactly the same code in the same framework with MATLAB or C or whatever you're doing, right, in a way that you understand, you can write about, but it's going to be very hard for somebody else to inherit um, and, and, and implement themselves. You might, they might, you might see the, 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 the equations, but when you go to implement the exact model, it becomes um, frictionful, at least, in, in a social sense, in a sociological sense. And so I, I just wonder is it, whether you, any of you share that impression, and if, if so, how we can get past that. Um, you know, I wonder, when you built a model of attention, whether you looked at the psychological literature, looked at the attentional models that were there and bought, bought, brought those in or, or put those in the arsenal of ones that you were going to test or whether you sort of just scratch your head and said, well, what could attention do here and then just did it, right? And, and I suspect, I'll gander that it was at least a lot like the latter, and I don't blame you because it's a pain in the butt to get those other models, even if you read about them in a paper, right? They're not there in a form you can pull in and plug in, right? Um, and, and that doesn't just go for integration, it goes for comparison. So if there's five models of how the hippocampus works out there, how do I get to compare them? It would be a lot easier if we had some tools to put them all together in one place and do sort of side-by-side -side comparisons. So as I said, it's, it's sort of a statement, but let me turn it now into a question and ask, what is your impressions of, of whether or not this is the critical challenge now, and if it is, what, what could be done to address it? So I agree it's a critical challenge. Um, that's why I think this conferences like this are great. Um, and yes, we mostly scratch our head and figure it out, well, attention. <laughs> Should be simple. It's uh, not. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, regarding the, the, the language, I think we already have that. We have mathematics, which I think is reasonably you know, shared. And we have um, code that is shared. So in the machine learning community, and especially in the deep learning community right now, everybody, including people in industry, for the most part, share their code. Uh, you want to be cited, you need to put out your code. And people reuse other people's code a lot. It's, it's, and it really is making, it's making it easy for others to reuse their code to build systems, you know, whether it's for scientific uh, research or for applications. So lots of startups are just picking you know, pieces of code from here and there, and yeah, here's a new application. So, so I think that at that level, we, we already have tools. I think it's uh, the, the different jargon and the, the, the lack of knowledge of each other. So there isn't enough points of contacts at the scientific research level. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be less optimistic. I don't think we do have the tools. I think, I think the problems you describe exist, even if you don't put the computational layer in. I think, you know, as, as, as you and I, I think, have talked about in the past, if you're just trying to connect a psychological question to a biological one, there's still a whole series of stages of misunderstanding, and attention is another good example there. There's a psychology of attention, which is well documented, well understood, theoretically sound, and then there's a physiology, a neurophysiology of attention, which, to my way of thinking, actually largely doesn't have anything to do with the psychology of attention, right? I mean, occasionally they intersect, but it's more by accident than by, uh, by design. Um, and so there are these two largely independent literatures which sort of pretend that they have to do with each other, but they don't. And so when Joshua comes in with yet a third version, <laughs> I don't think it really matters, you know. <laughs> it's just so, another, another weirdness on that same name. You know? So is the answer to take a lesson from the machine learning community and start writing things down in a more precise way that can be exchanged or 
is there a deeper problem or another problem? I think, I, I mean, I would like to believe... I'd like to see that. that. I'd like to see it's a matter just of, of writing theories in a consistent way. I mean, it's, you know... We all struggle, experimentalists and I'm sure theorists, with, with trading code with each other. Sure, it's great to publish code. On the other hand, uh, you know, if I publish mine or you publish yours and some third person tries to combine them into a, into a product. I, I can't even get my graduate students' code to work. <laughs> Not that it doesn't work for them, but for me to get it to work. Maybe that's my problem. I can't get my own code to work, John. <laughs> so yes, these, are, these problems, I think it would be nice if we could solve them with code, but it's not just that. Well, there might kind of be, oh, this is a totally different sound. Back to this one. There might kind of be two different problems, right? And one of them is sort of a, a, a philosophical challenge, which is that ultimately, w once, as we become more successful in modeling the brain, it's going to be kind of like a patchwork quilt. Like certain kinds of models will be maybe, you know, normative models. Like Weiji Ma will tell us what, you know, what the brain should be doing. And then someone else will have an idea about how that might be implemented through gain control or attention or, or whatever. And, and there might not really be a unified piece of code that's going to capture both of those things because they're kind of fundamentally different. Um, but I think maybe there's a second problem that's not so much philosophical as logistical as getting people to speak the same language and have the same code. And I think, I mean, I think you, you have some ideas about that, right? And from your own from your own lab about how to do that, maybe you can I do. comment. <laughs> Turn the question back to you. I, I don't want to take advantage of the moderator role, so I'll, I'll be happy to talk about that with anybody afterwards that wants to hear about it. Sorry, you, you don't want to take advantage. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question over there. Yeah. Good. Let's yeah. Let's take questions from the audience. <laughs> Somebody want to circulate a mic? Yes, circulate the mic. Yeah, I, here, I, I can, can share. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the Macala Pitts model, as well as that layers network, all right, led to multilayer perceptron, <clears throat> which led to today's deep learning machine, all right, and uh, the uh, the hierarchical architecture, as well as the max pooling, led to convolutional network, okay? And uh, convolutional network has led to even more significant development, all right? Now, it's obvious that we should learn from the brain, okay? Now, in the neural network, in each neuron, uh, well, in fact, uh, the dendrites consume six, more than 60% of the energy used by the brain, okay? And they occupy more than 90% of the surface of the neurons. Yet, dendrites have not been included in the, in the deep learning machines, right? So I think that we should uh, ask the question, how dendrites? So, so you mean nonlinear interactions at the dendrite? Huh? You mean nonlinear interactions at the dendrite? Because of course, this this sort of simplified synapses that we have uh, are just right. summing. The synapses, all right, lie on the dendrites, all right. However, in the early 1980s, people found that dendrites compute, all right, in a nonlinear fashion. They do significant computation. However, the dendrite computation has not been included in modern day uh, deep learning machines, okay? Uh, I would like to know whether anyone or any of the panelists or anyone from the audience has any thought about the possibility of including dendrites in the deep learning machine. Question number one. Number two. Wait, wait, wait. Let's do one at a time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You want, you want me to finish all the questions, or you want me to answer them, a, a, ask the question one by one? No. Maybe let's let's quickly ask the other two. I okay. All right. So I, I I already told you about the, the review the history. All right. So it's, it should be quick. Number one, <laughs> Professor Benjo pointed out in in his talk that the back propagation is not widely accepted as. Uh, as a, 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 as, as, as a possible implementation in the brain. All right, now, question is that, how do we get rid of back propagation and still keep the power of a deep learning machine? Okay, question number three. 
we know that uh, unsupervised learning, all right, is very important in the brain, okay? I know that uh, Dr. Benjo is going to tell me that, uh, well, he's got uh, unsupervised learning, but his unsupervised learning is auto-association. Auto not necessarily. Uh, not true? Not necessarily. For example, I talked about but, GANs. But anyway, well, okay, just let me talk about the auto-encoder. Auto, auto, auto Give them a chance to reply. Okay. Auto-encoder <laughs> prepares the network for supervisor training, okay? They are not stand-alone supervisor training, but we need unsupervised training, because that in dealing with big data, right, we don't have the manpower or, or any resources to hand the label a, 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 any, 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 any piece of data, all right? And another thing is that. I, I think we I okay. think got the question. Got it. How, how um, does auto-encoding okay. so, and auto-association work? In fact, so did you, hear, did you hear Jan Lukens, did you hear Jan Lukens' presentation, you know, as he, as he was outlining, did you hear Jan Lukens' presentation? Uh, I think he spent quite a bit of time explaining why in the machine learning community we are now considering unsupervised learning as one of the most important questions, and there are a lot of people working on these models. I, you know, he mentioned uh, GANs that I mentioned as well, but there's uh, uh, you know variational encoders and, and many other methods that people are looking at. It's one of the most exciting areas of research in deep learning these days. So there's a lot of research in that direction. Uh, another thing is, uh, I don't think the brain is doing any supervised learning. It's just doing unsupervised and reinforcement learning. There's, there's, of course, there's no you know teacher coming into our head and saying this is what you should have done. If if you take it literally as the supervisor coming from the outside world, but you yes. can imagine that there are internal systems that are providing vectorial Yeah, so, so we're on... trying to predict the future, for example, but that's unsupervised. That's unsupervised. I mean, like, uh, the probability of the next thing given the previous things, if you do that all the time, actually models the joint distribution of everything. So it, it's, it is unsupervised learning, but we can use, so the important thing that I mentioned is that we can use the tools that we've discovered for solving problems with uh, label data, supervised learning, to do both unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. It, it, you know, so backprop has been, become the workhorse of both of these approaches in, in deep learning. Uh, regarding your first question, I, I don't know much work in the direction of, uh, there is some work, but very little work as far as I know, but one of the things we're doing, uh, Walter Sen has these ideas of using uh, the nonlinearity in, in the synapses and the dendrite to help implement things like backprop. So there, there are, uh, there, there, I think more generally, your question is about uh, what is the right level of abstraction about what's going on in, in the brain that's necessary in order to implement the kinds of things we want to implement in machine learning. I think that's, of course, we don't know the answer to that, and we have to explore. So let me just. Add. Yeah, I was going to ask the the real physiologist here to. <laughs> no, I mean or I, one of the physiologists I, here. To I, tell I us mean, I, I think what Yosho said is is apt. I mean, I think there are levels of detail that one could, in principle, put into any of these models. The question is whether they repay the effort in terms of improved computational power. We don't know, I think, much about dendritic computation that cannot be encapsulated by the other kinds of computational styles that are, styles that are built into these networks already. That is to say, nonlinear combinations, separate nonlinear combinations in parts of the dendritic tree, which are then linearly combined and lead to some output at the neuron. I don't think there's anything about that particular piece of anatomy that isn't captured by the concept of, an, of, of the networks that, are, that people are using now, at least at the level of precision that one worries about. So, I mean, I, my, my guess is that um, if there were a problem that could be better solved by putting dendrites into it, somebody in Yoshua's group would have tried that and made um, it work. Maybe not. So let me put something positive here. <laughs> let me put something positive. I think there's actually a lot of opportunity for neuroscientists to bring something to deep learning by trying out things that you know they see in in in, in neurons and, and synapses and, and I mean one example it would be divisive normalization. I mean that's a crude form, right? But it's taking advantage of the morphology to say something computational. Maybe someone else? <laughs> Wait, there, let, let's let's give other people a chance to ask questions. Over here, yeah. Do you want to yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I have a very more general question. Uh, my question is that how was this meeting uh, different from a traditional 
computational or cognitive meeting or how any of the presentations here are going to change our approaches of doing computational stuff from what we did since 30 years ago, because we all cite more, and at the same time, we are going to do the same things. How we did this, um, how did we progress through this meeting? I'll, I'll comment on that. I mean, I, th I think the field has changed a lot, and I think also that the tools are available for examining and manipulating neural activity have been totally transformative. I don't know the extent to which the principles that have been garnered from the use of those approaches have percolated into cognitive neuroscience, but I think they will. I think now that we have animal models of decision-making, attention, multisensory integration, and we have the tools to be able to do cortex-wide imaging at a, a very good spatial and temporal resolution to manipulate neural activity in cell type specific manner, to measure the activity of neurons in a layer specific manner, to understand what computations are taking place across the different layers, that, that transforms our understanding of how these uh, cognitive abilities we've known about for a long time uh, are actually implemented in the brain. I think it's a huge change. I have more of it next year, maybe. <laughs> we'll just have to stay I mean, here until we get done. <laughs> I, think, I think you're right. I think there is kind of a gap in the sense that people within, the, within systems neuroscience who are using animal models have been really, really inspired by the cognition literature, perception literature. I mean, it's our sort of workflow in my lab is to comb the perceptual literature and find behaviors that we like and that have a strong theoretical foundation and support them to animals. But I think there could be a lot more communication between people who are really experts in those cognitive functions and people who want to train animals to do them so that they can study uh, uh, study their neural underpinnings. And I think that has happened to, to an extent in, in certain subfields, but I think you're right. I think that could happen a lot more, and I think it would benefit both fields. Here. So one way, I think uh, everyone in here uh, are either working on two questions. Here. Uh, one is basically reverse engineering the brain. The other one is getting to a better AI at their level of brain, right? So one way of formulating the, the, and the, the way to get to this answer is basically coming up with a space of hypothesis and uh, trying to search in that space. And eventually, we're going to hope that we, get upon, we come across the, the correct solution on that space, right? And uh, we can basically formulate the problem for each of the fields, the neuroscience field and the machine learning science. And uh, basically, the choice we need, we need to make is an efficiency choice. Which, which way forward would be more efficient. I'm sure maybe not everyone in this room would agree with this approach to the problem, but uh, this, is, this is a way of thinking about this problem in general. But uh, it seems like given the, the, the computation power that we have right now, at least for the, uh, in the field of machine learning, uh, maybe if we give enough time to the field of machine learning, just going, searching the whole space, given enough time or might get us to the, to the solution faster. And maybe the choice that we need to make is how much, how much of time and computation or money do we need, should we invest in each field in order for all the community to, the community to get to the answer faster? So. <laughs> so, so one thing I want to say about this is, and maybe that's what you had in mind, but it seems to me clear that if you think of research as a search problem, um, then if the question is uh, how does the brain work um, at a level of abstraction that we can, say, use to build machines that have equivalent power, then we need to uh, combine both kinds of constraints about you know, what would the brain plausibly be able to implement and at the same time would be able to do the kinds of complicated computation and learning that the brain does, uh, and, and that, uh, you know, it would like AI to do as well. So it's, it's combining those two constraints, but for that to happen, we need more people that understand the two sides of the coin, and I don't think we have enough of them. Okay, we have time for one more question over here. So I want to ask a question again about levels, the right level, and uh, learning. So we were talking about machine learning tasks, but many of the machine learning tasks that we're asking brains to solve are actually learning tasks, and we don't have good neuroscience tools to measure the learning. 
We can measure the representations, the neural activity. So there's a huge disconnect there. And it's a similar disconnect with the kind of psychology, like, uh, you know, high level cognitive tasks that we're asking. How do we bridge those levels? And what's the right level there for learning? Should I go first? Sure. So maybe, I might need a clarification. So why, why do you say that we don't have the right, don't have appropriate tools in neuroscience to study learning? Well, you mean that, in the sense that it's difficult to, to observe a subject longitudinally as learning is occurring, or that no, we don't have the right learning. tools to, to measure synaptic? Yeah, in, in a machine learning context, we can measure how all the weights change. We can't do that in a brain. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I, if I were going to answer, Zach, I would, I, and, and at Columbia, this is a dangerous thing to say, but I don't think anybody I know in this business has ever seen an engram or has ever seen an encoded memory in a way that you can unambiguously identify as such. And so if you're Zach and you're looking for the physiological representation of a learned thing in the brain, you have the problem that you don't know what you're looking for. Uh, you might have good imagination and have ideas about synaptic change and so on and so forth, but I don't think any of us have a coherent theory about how all of that sticks together to make a learned effect. So that's a, that's a biology problem. I mean, I, I think that's a problem which is not a cross-levels problem. I think you can lay that securely at the door of the physiologists who failed so far to find the right level of answer. Although I think there is a problem, which is what I thought you meant uh, for psychologists, which is it's just the time frame. Uh, and, and perhaps for physiology too. I mean, how many people have recorded from a monkey over the 10 or 100,000 trials it takes to learn something? There are a few. Yeah, and, and a few and, neurons, right? And, and a few so neurons, I, and, and yeah. there are changes, and making them but, into an account of learning is but, different. But I'm just saying, it's a practical problem. It's yeah. really hard. It takes time. The learning rates are defined. We don't get to define them, right? And speed them up and see what happens. And so, for whether it's monkeys in the lab or people in the laboratory, we're interested right now in, in sort of act, skill acquisition and re representational change that occurs in underlying skill acquisition. You know, we're trying to get 10 data points from the brain over three months of training, and that is a Herculean effort. So it's, it, there's just practical problems. And, and here is where I think maybe, you know, starting to explore the synthetic space, w when we start to trust it at least as a proto model of what's going on in the brain, might actually be useful as, as a guide. I agree that the synthetic space would be useful, but I, th I think we are in a moment where we really can learn a lot from the measuring neurons than ever before, because with imaging, right, you can image easily 300, 600 neurons at a time, and you can go back to the same neurons every day using a couple of different tricks that are pretty straightforward to implement. And you can see how that population activity is changing as an animal goes from being a novice to an expert on a task. And that isn't the same as seeing the weights change, because you can't directly measure the weights, but you can still learn a lot about how that population activity is changing changing? How does its shape change? How do the different players that make up that population, how, how does their contribution to the output change as the animal is going from, from novice to expert? So I think those new tools offer, I don't think Tony agrees, I think those new tools offer a lot of potential. <laughs> so I don't take away anything at all from that, but I'll, I'll just say that the, the, the kind of solution that ends measurements represent is the same kind of solution that many people who would study attention physiologically would represent. They would say, I'll study these neurons in an unattended situation, and I'll study them in an attended situation, and I'll document changes. I won't know exactly how those changes arise, and I won't really have an account of how attention emerges from that change. I'll have an association. So in the case of learning, you would have a big hint that things might change, but I still don't think it's what Zach wanted, which was basically a theory of how learning happens in the brain. So I just want to add one last thing. From the point of view of what, what I would like to see, which is bridging the gap between deep learning and neuroscience, clearly you're right. Clearly we need better tools, engineering tools to you know, poke into the brain and look at changes in synapses in real time, something that I don't think we're able to do. And if, if the community thinks that it's an important problem, that it could unlock important mysteries about the brain, then there'll be you know, more research and development of these kinds of tools. I actually have to ask a question of Anne, because she's the other physiologist here, but any other physiologist in the room. How many people would be willing to bet a lot, I mean a lot, something really significant, on the statement that all learning changes in the brain are captured by changes in synaptic weights? Would you be willing to bet a lot on that? <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> Would anybody else? But you guys all do that. I mean, you know, yeah, right? Yeah, make, right. And, and you wouldn't be alone. So, yeah. Okay. I think that's probably a good place to stop, as any. <laughs> so let's thank our panelists.